let's glorify the name of Jesus. Let's glorify the Almighty God. He's worthy of your praise. He's deserving of hand claps and foot stomping and shouts of glory. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Welcome to Sunday morning at Cornerstone. Amen. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It's my honor to stand in this sacred place. Um, as it has been for 30 plus years. The honor is still awesome as it ever was. And I respect that. And I want glory, the glory of God to settle in upon us this morning. I want him to speak to us. How many want the Lord to talk to you? I mean, if we're just going to church just to show up, let's go get a Coke. You buy. Something's supposed to happen when God's people get together. A whole lot more than just a handshake. Thank God for handshakes. It's supposed to be a visitation. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 13 said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Everybody say, Fear God. Doesn't seem to be much of that in the earth today. The church should be fervent with fear of the Lord and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. It doesn't say of saved man or church people. Of man. Verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I want to use an old cliche, and I want to preach this this morning. When it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, and done. Snippet version, when it's over. When it's over. Pray with me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your word is anointed. It's quick. It's powerful. And it always finds the spot of the hungry, of the thirsty. But it also finds the place, God, of the malcontents and the disturbed and the confused pleading the blood today that as I preach, the anointing will break yokes. It'll tear down strongholds. It'll rip, rip apart facades and veneers. And God, you'll find the soul of men and women hungering and thirsting after you. Bless your word today to every hearer, and then let us be doers of what we hear today. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Good to see our friends, brother and sister Pescado. God bless you. I honor you. Our world is in such confusion, and that goes without saying, and it's in such an awful and distorted state of life, and living, and being. It's probably life and living is disturbed and distorted because the beings are confused. And distorted. Every or even Christians are are seemingly, and that's a broad term, Christian, are being sucked in by the spiritual environmental climate change swirling all around us. And it it it, it I, I'm a firm believer that it doesn't get into the church. Because my Bible tells me the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But people who come to the church building that is um, owned by the church and God, some of us, even here today, we're confused. We, in our, our, our appearance and our actions and our words, fully display that 
we are confused by the confusion out there. And so since they're 20 degrees below normal, we feel it's okay if we'll be 40 degrees below normal because we're still a little bit better than they are. Folks, you need to get your eyes off the world and quit gauging your spirituality by their lack thereof or their spirituality. Titus or Timothy received a letter from his pastor, the Apostle Paul, and he said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly or distinctly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits here means roving or tramp spirits. That's really what it means. Imposters and misleaders. And there's a bunch of them out there. And then he said, and doctrines of devil, which is instructions and instructors and their teaching. So it's not just men teaching these doctrines. It is demons themselves. And I'm going to, I'm not weakening it down, but it's demonic, demonic doing the teaching and instructing, and they're using men and mediums to get their message out. Verse 2, he said, these, these spirits, these seducing spirits and these doctrines of devils, verse 2, he said, they're speaking lies in hypocrisy, that this is okay where it used to be wrong, and this is all right now when we used to take stands. And Having their, listen to this, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The phrase seared with a hot iron comes from the word, which we get our word, cauterize. It means to brand. They've had their mind branded, cauterized, seared, to render insensitivity. Brothers and sisters of Cornerstone and whoever you may be today, it's time for us to heighten our sensitivity, number one, to God, his word, and his voice. It's time to turn off the world and turn on the holy God who is Lord of all. Because when it's all said and done, the number one requirement of man is to fear God and obey his commandments. There's way too many people. Religions, heathens, Pentecostals, apostolics. Too many of us are living only in the here and now. We don't give enough forethought to tomorrow and what's coming and where we are headed and where we'll be when we get there. There's seemingly so little consciousness of an afterward. And I know you believe in an afterword, but there's not enough consciousness or what comes next or what's coming later or what comes afterward. Would you say amen? We're living in the broad spectrum day of excusing ourselves because we fail to remember we are supposed to obey God and we're supposed to fear God. Yet, we don't fear God, and we don't obey his commands, and we have excuses and arguments, it'll be all right. Sorry, folks, uh, things don't just turn out all right. Have you ever noticed how that evil just happens, but good very rarely just happens? Uh, somebody's working for the good of them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. They don't just happen. We're living in that day where excuses and arguments dominate the landscape of mankind. A French proverb says this, he who excuses himself accuses himself. Kierkegaard said, for a poisonous breath, or like a poisonous breath over the fields, like a mass of locusts over Egypt. So the swarm of excuses is a general plague, a ruinous infection among men that eats off the sprouts of the eternal. An American proverb says, excuses are merely nails used to build a house of failure. 
Michael Green had this to say. An excuse has been defined, and you've heard this one, as the skin of reason stuffed with a lie. Let, let me give to you seven types of people with arguments and excuses about God and salvation. Because when it's all said and done, the only thing left standing is going to be God and those that are saved and called by his name, and those that fear him and have obeyed him. The atheist has his arguments and excuses. Uh, there is no God. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The agnostic has his arguments and excuses. No way of really knowing. But the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The deceived have their excuses and arguments. Uh, my way is all right, but the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The unconvinced have their excuses and their arguments. Well, I'm not lost. I'm okay like I am. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The careless are full of their arguments and excuses. Well, I'm not living good enough. To be saved. But Jesus said, I'm not come to call the righteous, uh, but the sinners, those who aren't living right enough or good enough, I've called them to repentance. The ignorant, the unaware, they rely on their excuses and their arguments. And boy, our world is filled with the unaware. They're saying, well, I'm just not worthy, or I've done the unpardonable sin. But my Bible tells me, whosoever will, let him take of the waters of life freely. That's you, that's me, that's all of them out there. Even the procrastinators have arguments and excuses. I will seek the Lord some other time. But my Bible says now is the accepted time. Today, this Sunday morning, right now, this dispensation of grace is the day of salvation. Would you lift your hands and thank God for his word. Thank God for the fear of God that you have in your heart that's caused you to get out of bed today. Thank you, God, that I got up this morning. I woke up this morning and you were on my mind see Jesus gave a parable about mankind in Luke 14 and mankind in his parable was filled with excuses a certain man he said made a great supper and he called many to that supper sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were called, that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. Let me paraphrase. It's church time. I've got blessings when you get to the house of God. It's prayer time. i got something for you on a Monday morning. It's a fast day on Tuesday. I want to pour out blessings, uh, but I need somebody to push away the food so I don't have to stumble over the mashed potatoes and gravy to get you the blessing that you've been praying for for 30 years. But they all begin with one consent, verse 18 in Luke 14. They began to make excuse. The businessman's excuse came first. Well, I bought a piece of ground, and I must need to go see it, and I pray that you'd have me excuse. How many people have bought a piece of ground without seeing it first? Excuses, excuses. We hear them every day. Then there's a working man excuse in verse 19. And another said, well, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. How many of you have ever bought a car that you didn't test drive and lift the hood and lift the trunk and checked in the glove box to make sure the manual was still there? Yeah. Well, I bought one online. Yeah, but they had all kinds of facts and everything else there. He said, I, you know, I need to go prove them. Have me excuse. How many would buy a car or buy a house or buy a yoke of oxen? You probably lost your mind if you're buying a yoke of oxen. Yeah. Or else you're really into Mother Earth and you are confused. Then there's the family man's excuse. Well, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Excuses. Surely. 
his, this man's Lord would have already known this man had a wife and would have said, hey, don't go to him. He's on his honeymoon. He's up in Niagara or Cancun. He might be having a hot date in Maui, Hawaii. Y'all get it? Maybe you can read the news this afternoon. You'll get what I'm talking about right there. The Lord's conclusion to this whole matter, the afterward, when it was all said and done, he said, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. This is what he said to the servant. For I say unto you that none of these men, none of them which were bidden, which were called, shall taste of my supper. When it's all said and done, they are no longer going to get in at supper time. One of the most profound reading books, I think, in the world is the book of Ecclesiastes. It is the writings of a backslidden preacher after coming back to some similitude and some senses, after having seared his conscience with a hot iron of idolatrous women, wives, and concubines. The author is Solomon for the most part, if not all parts. Ecclesiastes means the preacher. It's taken from the Septuagint, which is the oldest Greek version of the Old Testament. And the meaning is one who convenes or addresses an assembly. Y'all didn't know Solomon was going to show up this morning, but here he is in Greg Wilbank's form. The purpose of this book, hear this, is to show the utter fallacy of things such as earthly sins, earthly pleasures, earthly pursuits as the chief happiness and end in life. Our text says, now hear the end of the matter. It's also to show the final conclusion of the whole godly life which is to fear God and to keep his commandments if you want to live forever with him in eternity. And it's also to show the truth and true religion, that truth, the truth and true religion is the chief thing. It's the paramount thing in life, and it's the only eternal thing of all. Here's some things the preacher states. I'm not going to get into chapter and verse. He gives 10 evidences of a backslidden condition. He gives four wrong pre principles that are stated, if not advocated. He gives 18 truths. He gives 26 points of solid good advice to every human being, not just Christians. He gives 20 facts about God. He gives five personal, his personal vain things. And he gives 30 things considered as vain or vanity. Would you say amen? In the reading of Ecclesiastes, as you read through it, and I'm sure you've done some study on it because it's an interesting book to read and it's an even more interesting book to study out. But the word vanity is used some 37 times in some form, either vain, which is one time, vanity, which is 33 times, and vanities is used four times. And there's a purpose for me bringing this up to you because when it's all said and done, Solomon said everything about here and now is just about vain vanity of vanities. He starts the book as if he doesn't think much of himself or much of anybody else. He starts the book as if he's lowering the boom on all of us. And it's crazy as he begins it because you know this man has lived it. He said the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Israel, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. And then sums that up with all is vanity. So five or six times in one verse he gives forth Everything in the word vanity here means meaningless, empty, transitory, 
and unsatisfactory, futile, and empty. So hear him today as he says, empty of emptiness, saith the preacher. Empty of emptiness. All is empty. Meaningless of meaninglessness, saith the preacher. Meaningless of meaninglessness. All is meaningless. And we could go on plugging in these meanings. Feudal, empty, transitory, unsatisfactory. And then he begins to expound. I'm not going to take time, but let me just touch a couple of them. Verse 14 of chapter 1, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Chapter 2, he deals with this word in, in, in verses 1, 4, 15, 17, 19, 21, 23, and 26. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just saying to you, when it's all said and done, Solomon said, it's all vanity, except for fearing God and obeying God's word. Obeying God's command. Chapter 3, chapter 4, he visits it several more times. Chapter 5, chapter 8, chapter 11, chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. That's how he started in chapter 1, verse 2. And here he's closing it out. Verse 9, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. While he was backslidden, he was still wise. He didn't lose his gift just because he lost his mind. Right. Folks, anointing does not mean approval. Right. Salvation does not mean permission. The anointing does not give you the right to be a flim-flam spiritual person. Solomon said, when I was in a backslidden state, I still taught the people wisdom. But it didn't do him any good because he wasn't obeying his own wisdom. He still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. Uh, then he said, but let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. When it's all said and done, fear God. Keep his commandments, uh, for this is the whole duty of man. Okay, you can sing great. You can dance great. You can talk in tongues fabulous. Uh, you, 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 you can preach uh, the house down at peak or summit or at cornerstone. But when it's all said and done, according to the wise man Solomon, the backslidden preacher, he said everything is vanity except for fearing God and obeying God. And believe me, I love singing. I love dancing. I love shouting. I love preaching. You can't beat any of it in a Pentecostal church. I don't care what the world has to offer. I don't care what religious gospel singers have to offer, and they write some fabulous songs. Uh, but, honey, I have a tough time listening to people that don't fear God, and I can tell by the way they conduct themselves uh, in life and the way they appear to conduct themselves as a human being uh, in gospel singing. I just look at them, and I shake my head and say, I'm not sure. And, and then, sure enough, Brother Jordan Fitzgerald shows up with the band, and they sing that song and they help me out a little bit. <laughs> they twist that song around back the right way for me. And so I I can I can I can somebody say amen. Let's lift our hands right now and ask him to help us. Listen to what the Word of God says about humanity. Job 14 and 1. I'm still preaching when it's all said and done. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Job 7. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and spent without hope. Verse 7. Oh, remember that my life is when. Poof, there it goes. Mine eyes shall no more see good. Psalms 90 and 9. We live and we spend our years as a tale that is told. It's told and then it's forgotten. The days of our years are three score and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score or eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon, it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days. 
Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Hear this. This is wisdom, said Solomon. Fear God and obey his commandments. Don't hedge your bets. Don't try to get around them. Don't try to undermine them. Don't try to explain them. Just do them. Everybody shout, just obey them. You see, life is too uncertain. It's too short. It's too small. It's just a little epitaph on a tombstone someplace of somebody you know. To live in an argumentative state of being about God and about his word and about salvation, heaven and hell. How many of you believe that heaven is real? You believe that hell is real? Life is way too short to live with an excuse mentality. Well, I, I, I just don't do that for God because, or I just have, you know, and it's just, you know, I'm, I'm getting old, or I've just gotten young, or I've just married a wife, or I've just got me a yoke of oxen, or I bought me a new jet ski, I got me a new set of golf clubs, I got me a new hunting dog, I got me a new automobile, I got me, I got me, I got me, and it's just excuse after excuse after excuse for when the Gentiles, Paul said in Romans 2, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also being witness you see every human being is created in the image of God and they're created like God like God means they have the ability to think and to feel and to believe to be made like God, they are hardwired. That comes from a licensed doctor of psychology and a medical doctor in North Carolina. They did a study, and they found that the human brain is hardwired to believe God. And so these Gentiles who are not under the law, yet they do things contained in the law, which then show the work of the law written in their hearts, saved or unsaved, the conscience also bearing witness. Listen to this, though. And their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. When it's all said and done, brothers and sisters, uh, only God counts forever, and he counts even today. Don't forget, he's not just the forever God. He is the today God, the God which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Let God be true, and let every man be a liar. Would you clap your hands uh, to the Almighty God? Don't clap to a sports figure. Don't clap to a Hollywood or a politician. Clap your hands to God and Shout unto him. That's what's going to last. That's what's going to count. When it's all said and done, when the dust settles. When Queen Elizabeth II was to be crowned as queen, she sent an invitation to those of her subjects chosen to be present for that occasion. The invitation was sent to peers of the realm, the members of her government, and to representatives even of the common people. Every invitation bore the same closing statement. All excuses ceasing. What does that mean? I'm going to put it in street vernacular. You better be here or else. There is an eternal call that has never stopped sounding. In every human heart in this room and outside this room, the receptor called the soul of man has picked up the signal. I don't believe there's a God. That means they picked up the signal. Well, I don't believe he's a personal God. That means they picked up the signal. God didn't give them their cookies and milk. God didn't give them the right wife or the right husband. God didn't give them the right pastor or the right church. God didn't give them the right doctrine or the right message. 
He stuck them in the church with all kinds of guidelines and rules and regulations and stipulations and qualifications and blah, 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 blah. And so I got to go find me something that believes like I believe. And that's what religion has done to the Word of God. They're bending it and they're twisting it to make the Word of God believe what they believe. No, I got to bend me. I got to break me until I'm matching what this says. This is the mirror, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter what you think or feel or believe. It matters what he thinks. It matters what he feels. It matters what he believes. Oh, he respects your thinking. He respects your feeling. He respects your belief. Well, God understands. Yeah, but God doesn't always like what he understands. Arguments about what was really required to be saved and excuses about why someone doesn't obey God is folly. Is the epitome of trivialness. Excuses and arguments are going to keep more people out of heaven than anything else. In my estimation, there's no greater sin than arguments and excuses and human reasoning. I'm moving into the conclusion. Romans 1 and 20 says, For the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power. Well, I just don't understand God. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. When it's all said and done, no one will stand before God and say, God, I just just didn't get it. He said, let me quote to you a scripture. Faith cometh by hearing. Who were you that on that crazy August Sunday morning when the white-haired old bishop finally took his turn in the pulpit? And he told you when it's all said and done, where were you? Well, I was down at the lake. I was chasing a snake. And got hit by a rake. What a break. When it's all said and done, will you only be left with an argument and an excuse? Felix in Acts said, well, uh, at a more convenient season, I- I- I'll hear more of you, Paul. Agrippa said, well, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The rich man, the Lord said to him, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these barns that are filled up with goods, who shall all these things be? When it's all said and done, what excuse will you use for not being ready? What argument will you present to God? You know, you can fly by the pastor or the bishop or the church, and you can fool us, and we like being fooled just as long as you come and pay your tithes and offerings. Not. I'm hungry for your soul this morning. I don't have anybody in mind as I'm preaching. I have everybody in mind as I'm preaching. I have myself in mind, but I'm not preaching to myself. God didn't call me to preach to myself. He called me to preach to people. Is there some human, scientific, or religious argument to present to God as to why you personally would not repent of your sins and turn your back and walk completely away from sin and walk towards God? It bothers me when I see people that are supposed to be repented still dipping their toe back into the cesspool of the world and of sin, and they come back and repent again and dip and sin again and and, then come back again. You haven't repented. You've got forgiveness. It's time to repent and to turn your back on that sin and walk away from it because when it's all said and done, you have made breath keep living in your sin, and you're supposed to be dead to sin. 
What about baptism? Baptism is not a cure-all. What it does is it washes our sins away, and then it covers us with the blood of Jesus. But that doesn't stop some of us from putting stuff back on top of that blood and sinning and crucifying Christ afresh and anew. It's time to be baptized once and for all. Can you shout amen? This Holy Ghost is not a ticket to glory. It is a call to high works of Almighty God, of lifting up holy hands unto God without wrath or doubting. What will you present at judgment? What will we present at judgment as to why we were not up to living and being holy and righteous and separate and godly in the sun toward generation? What will an argument and an excuse be worth in hell when it's all said and done? Hebrews 9 and 27, and as it is appointed a man wants to die. It says we're appointed to die. It doesn't say we have an appointed time to die. It just says it's appointed. We'll die. Well, he died before his time. Well, he died. I guess not. Does God know when you're going to die? Yeah, he does. It's appointed. Man's going to die. But after this, there's an afterward. There's the judgment. When it's all said and done, what good is my argument at judgment? What good will my excuse do for me for not being this or not doing this or not following this? No, there's, there's not going to be any excuses or arguments there. What will you do with God, his word, his salvation? Why not repent today? Why not be baptized in Jesus' name? If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, you haven't been baptized, come and get baptized in the only saving name, Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When it's all said and done, how are you baptized? And the Holy Ghost did come to the instruments. When it's all said and done, when the drugs stop being dispensed, when it's all said and done, when the booze dries up, When it's all said and done, when the promiscuous ways come to a halt, when fleshly pleasures disappear, when all the money blows away, even Kansas sang about it. And when the music dies, when the lights are turned off, Close your eyes for just a moment. Here at the end. Listen to the half brother of Jesus Christ. He said, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth God any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And then when it's all said and done, when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. you do with your life today? Would you stand with me? Would you lift your hands and would you touch God? Is there an awe? Is there a fear? Is there a respect? Is there an appreciation? Is there a desire, a depth of longing? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. 
keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Well, I'm not a Christian. It don't matter. If you're a human being, you have a duty. And God expects us to fulfill it. And that is to fear him and keep his commandments. That means we keep the whole book. There's a law. There's a war going on in our members. The law of righteousness and the law of unrighteousness. And they're at war. And they're trying to destroy you. They're trying to destroy me. They're trying to wipe out the new convert, the seasoned convert. I'm not troubled, but I keep hearing and seeing things that it's just so astounding to me that that people are so easily turned from fearing God. The topsy-turviness of our world is because we've lost the fear of God. Get rid of the police. Why would we get rid of the police and keep politicians? And it's the politicians that are hollering, get rid of the police. Makes no sense. It's iniquity. It's lawlessness. And the book tells me that because iniquity, lawlessness shall abound, the love of many, and I'm pointing at you, not indicating and indicting you, but we're, we're losing our kids, our children, our teenagers, young adults, marriages disintegrating before our very eyes. Young marriages being annulled because the young lady or the young man didn't like the new place they were living. Didn't like the new deal they were getting. That's not fear of God. I open this altar to everybody. If you're a guest, if you're a visitor, you're welcome here in this altar. This is a place to come and to find out when it's all said and done, where am I going to be standing? I don't want an argument. I don't want an excuse. I don't want a reason. I just want to fear God. I just want to obey his commands. As they sing, would you come? We don't have much longer. Sir, you got to make every moment count. Sister, every moment counts in your marriage, in your family, in the church, in the world. What will you do? Let's leave a mark. Let's make a mark. Let's give glory to God. Let's give praise to God with our life with our voice, with our bodies, with our minds, with our souls. Soon it will all all be over. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, give your life to Jesus.